in a letter to an acquaintance regarding the newly established United States Constitution. Benjamin Franklin famously wrote, In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And if we were only to look at this world, this earthly realm, that would seem to be accurate. However, may I submit to you one more certainty in life. Temptation. It can be used as a synonym for the word entice, which means to attract artfully or adroitly by arousing hope or desire. And let's just be super honest here. It's a phenomenon we all experience. As children, perhaps we feel an enticement to sneak one more cookie from the jar. As teenagers, we struggle with the allure of wanting to fit in and be liked. And so we become tempted to lash out at our parents or engage in risky behavior. As adults, well, I wonder if the number of times a day we are tempted could even be counted on our fingers. Because nowadays, the world is getting smarter. Our phones seem to be listening to us. And so when we pull up social media to innocently see our friend's new baby, bam, we're hit by ads targeted to the things that we like or talk about the most. Perhaps like me, you receive almost daily offers in the mail from credit card companies, making it possible to live large and purchase beyond our means. In the background, the world pushes us forward in a constant march of achievement, measured not by character, but by the stuff we have, the titles we bear, the money in our bank accounts. And to top it off, the current culture, at least in the United States, is one without limits or truth, really, or even boundaries. We constantly face temptation. We constantly wrestle with myriad enticements that take up too much space in our minds and hearts. It is a battle with a capital B. But you want to know the other truth? For this, God does not condemn us, nor does he judge us. Rather, God says, hold my grapevine. <laughs> Let me wade into this mess too, via Jesus. Let me show you that with faith you can absolutely face these temptations head on and win. Welcome to the Bridge to Belief podcast, season two, episode two, death, taxes, and temptation from Matthew chapter four, verse one. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Reverend Kimberly Constant, and the pastor behind the Bible study cover to cover and the bridge, which is our soon to be launched online worship community. And this season of the podcast, I'm offering weekly deep dives into verses and passages. These happen to follow along with the content in my Bible study, Emmanuel, and they also provide weekly reflection for our online faith community, The Bridge. If you would like more about these offerings, you can find the information on my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. So today's deep dive comes from the Gospel of Matthew's account of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by the tempter himself, Satan. And before we unpack Jesus' temptation, we've got to discuss Satan. He is one figure in the Bible who often is greatly misunderstood and or misinterpreted. He's either relegated to a character of mere myth, or he's elevated to a level of power that he does not possess. Satan tends to be dismissed either with a laugh of embarrassment that anyone would believe in such a fairy tale, or he becomes the thing that we fear so much that we don't want to talk about him or even mention his name. So first let's address who is Satan? Is he real? And if so, how much power does he have? Well, he first shows up in the Bible in the Old Testament, where we find that Satan isn't a common name. It refers to a title. Except for one verse in the books of the Chronicles, the Old Testament writers call him the Satan. And if we translate that from the original Hebrew, we might say something like the accuser or the slanderer or the adversary. And this ne'er-do-well, the Satan, 
shows up in some of the writings of the prophets. He shows up in the Garden of Eden, disguised as a talking serpent. And he shows up in the Book of Job, the oldest of all biblical texts. In all of these, the Satan functions as an accuser by way of temptation. That is his method for trying to achieve separation between humans and God, between humans and other humans, and even between humans and creation. It's been the Satan's goal since humans were first put on this earth, and the Satan will keep on trying until he's thrown into the fiery lake of damnation for all eternity. Why? Well, as we'll read later in our New Testament studies, Satan was once an angel in God's kingdom. Now, angels are a separate and distinct group of beings. They were created by God to serve God in the heavenly cosmic realm. They are not humans, although they do come to earth at times. We see it in the Bible. They do interact with humans. And we are not angels, nor do we become angels when we die. So the Satan of the Old Testament was an angel who fell because angels, like humans, were created with free will. They are able to choose whether or not to remain in God's kingdom and continue to serve God. And at some point, the Satan chose to defy God once and for all. And theology tells us that he wanted to be like God. Satan wanted to be God. And he wanted to build a kingdom for himself on earth. A kingdom of men and women who he would seek to separate from God via temptations that would lead us astray that would lead us to sin more and more until we turned so far away from God that we began to embrace the darkness, to embrace Satan's glittery illusions that that come from an ancient liar and chief, cheat and thief and narcissist. Satan's goal was and is to get us to turn away from God's kingdom and choose Satan's kingdom instead. So by the time we get to the New Testament, the Satan has become Satan with a capital S, and he has set himself up as an adversary of Jesus, the Messiah. And although Jesus will prove that Satan is in no way Jesus equal, the temptation that Satan brings, the evil that Satan tries to stir up in the hearts of men, the darkness that envelops, well, we will see that is absolutely real. It was real. It is real. And yes, Satan is real. And he does have power, but it is limited. It's held in check, if you will. And we're going to read in the Gospels that Satan has been defeated by Jesus. He has been sentenced to eternal death. And that's a punishment that will be carried out when Jesus returns to execute judgment and make God's kingdom fully manifest. So the first mention of the now proper name Satan with a capital S is in the account of Jesus Christ, and it comes fairly early on, just after Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River, having received the affirmation of God his Father, as well as the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful moment. (laughs) And then in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, Satan. So following that amazing moment in Jesus' baptism where we first see evidence of the triune God of Christianity, Satan strikes. And God allows it. It's part of Jesus' preparation for ministry. It's a chance for Jesus' righteousness to be proved. So God's spirit leads Jesus to the place where this trial will occur. But what we also note is that Jesus was prepared because he stayed connected to God. We read in Matthew that for 40 days and nights, Jesus fasted. And Luke tells us during that entire time period, Jesus was being tested by Satan in ways that go unmentioned. And at the end of it, naturally, Jesus is hungry. Can you even imagine? I can barely go four hours without eating. I can't imagine anything more than that. And so Satan misunderstands. He sees Jesus' hunger as weakness, but it was not because Jesus' fasting was intentional. It was a means of preparation. It was a way for him to connect to God and tap into his spiritual power via the Holy Spirit. And so the hunger that resulted didn't deplete Jesus. It actually made him stronger because 
he became more aware of God's presence. He became completely reliant on God's presence to sustain him in that wilderness as hunger reigned and darkness descended. And so when Satan first verbally tempts Jesus, he appears out of the darkness, whispering, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And there's that word, if. Please, Satan knew. Satan was foaming at his evil mouth with the thought of turning Jesus, the very son of God, away from his father. What a prize Jesus would be, I'm sure he thought. What a win it would mean if Satan could tempt Jesus into entering not God's kingdom, but Satan's. You see, Satan, unlike God, is not all seeing and all knowing. He is not all powerful. He is not sovereign. And he is not God's equal or match. He is a lesser being. Be it a crafty, evil, manipulative, selfish, self-seeking being with only one thing on his mind, toppling the kingdom of God. And Jesus would have been the ultimate feather in his cap. I'm sure Satan imagined that the whole world might turn to him if he could secure Jesus. And so he attacked both if you notice, physically and spiritually. Hungry Jesus, make your own food. God's son, prove it. Show me. Why are you allowing yourself to suffer, Jesus? Why put on this show and you can make these stones become bread? And Jesus replies, not with his own words, but with those of God. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus does not fall victim to the lure of pride, which might have prompted him to lash out at the insinuation that Jesus was anything less than he was. He does not fall victim to the gnawing physical hunger because Jesus knows that that physical hunger will always come and go. While we live in these earthly, dusty human bodies, our hunger the physical hunger, it will never be satisfied. Food only quenches it for a time. But spiritual hunger, it absolutely can be filled when we seek the right spiritual food, which is the word of God. It's the absolute fundamental truth. And it's about God and us and this beautiful and broken creation in which we live. And now that's not to say that our physical hunger doesn't matter because it does. And and in later in Matthew, Jesus is actually going to tell us just how much God cares about all of our physical needs. But our spiritual hunger, filling that has eternal implications. So round one, Jesus with one and Satan ends up with zero. So he tries again. Satan brings Jesus to the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem. And there they survey the holy city of God before them. This is the place which the prophets foretold would become the pinnacle of creation and the source of living water. And Satan repeats that word, if. If you are the son of God, he says, throw yourself down from here because you know the angels will come and save you. The idea being that if Jesus were to catapult off the temple, he would arouse the attention of the people gathered there for worship. They would see his angelic rescue and know that he was the son of God. So in a way, Satan was offering Jesus a bypass of the difficult ministry that lay ahead. Again, the attack was both physical and spiritual. Satan insinuating that there was no need for Jesus to waste his time in ministry to a hard-headed people who wouldn't believe him. And oh, by the way, we're probably going to torture him just like they did the prophets of the Old Testament. Satan was saying, Jesus, just make yourself known here and now. You can avoid the pain and the sorrow and the frustration and the agony that lies ahead. And then, in Satan's craftiness, having learned from his first attack that Jesus was going to use God's word, Satan tries to use God's word first. But he doesn't do it correctly because Satan's the father of lies. And so he's going to always struggle when he speaks God's truth. So Satan misinterprets and misapplies the words of Psalm 91 which ironically is a psalm about trusting in God and receiving sustenance and protection from God. So again, Jesus stands strong, not using his own words, but the true and correct intent of the word of God. 
Jesus replies, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it is in that context preceded by a reminder from Moses to fear God and God alone. And it's followed by a command to choose what is right and good, and God would, quote, thrust out the enemies of God's people. So Jesus too, Satan still zero. And then in the final temptation, Satan takes Jesus to another high mountain from which he can view the splendors of the world entire. And this is Satan's ultimate offer. He says to Jesus, all this I will give you if you just bow down and worship me. And here, Satan relies on his favorite tactic, which is speaking outright lies. For Satan did not and does not have the authority to give Jesus the world. The world is is not for Satan's to give. Only God can do that. So here again, Satan miscalculated. He attempted to attack Jesus both physically and spiritually again by offering Jesus the ultimate fast pass to avoid the suffering and difficulties that awaited. In a sense, Satan once more trying really to call God into question and kind of insinuate, you know, Jesus, God is going to send you down this path of pain and suffering and sacrifice. What is that? And then Satan pointing at himself, if we might imagine, saying, and here I am. I'm, I'm offering you a shortcut to power and authority and glory. And it doesn't involve any pain or suffering or hardship. Oh, that's tempting. But as we see, Jesus does not fall for the lie because Jesus knows the word of God. He knows the truth of God and he is connected to God. And so Jesus speaks for the first time his own words, away from me, Satan. And this is followed by another quote from Deuteronomy, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Because Jesus is full of God's spirit. After his baptism, he had received the Holy Spirit. He's connected to God via the spiritual discipline of fasting, and I imagine prayer as well. He knows God's word, and Jesus knows that the path of the Messiah is a path of the ultimate suffering servant, because Isaiah prophesied that, and he knew God's word. Jesus knew that his purpose on earth was not to elevate himself, but to humble himself and become a servant king. Jesus' purpose on earth was not to worship the devil, but to destroy the devil. And Jesus' purpose on earth was to deliver deliver all human beings from powerlessness by redeeming and restoring us and empowering us with God's spirit so that we might follow Jesus' example and resist the temptations of Satan, fleeing from evil, turning from darkness, and embracing the light of God. We will read in the first letter of John, Chapter 3, verse 8, that, quote, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, which is sin. And that destruction began right there in the wilderness, in that one-on-one confrontation between Satan and Jesus, in which Jesus won and showed us all how to win. For Jesus was victorious in his human strength. Had he tapped into his divinity, had he made those stones become bread, had he thrown himself from the temple to be saved by angels, had he worshipped Satan, he would have lost. But it was not God's will for him to tap into that divinity. It was God's will for Jesus to bring the gospel message through the humility of a human life. It was God's will for Jesus to rejoice and suffer and grieve and laugh, to love and be rejected as we all are and will be in this world. It was God's will for Jesus to sacrifice himself for our sake so that we could know the deepest and most fundamental truths of God. God loves us. God wants to have a relationship with us, but God wants it to be genuine, one that we choose over and over again. And every time we make the choice for God, we chip away at Satan's kingdom of darkness and God's kingdom of light grows. So how is Jesus victorious over temptation? The word of God 
spiritual disciplines, the power of the Holy Spirit. Dear listeners, we have all these same tools. We can prepare like Jesus. We can absolutely study his word. That's what you're doing right now. We can pray. We can practice our own spiritual disciplines, whichever ones help us the most. And then when temptation strikes, we voice the word of God. So here's what I want you to do. Find a verse or two that you commit to memory. It can be simple. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It can be an entire psalm or all of Romans 8 if you're good at memorizing things. Whatever it is, let it be something that you can access when the moment of trial hits. Likewise, when temptation comes, turn on worship music. Most of us have some kind of smartphone these days, and we can put music onto those smartphones. We can access worship music at any time and in any space. And sometimes when you can't give the words or or Bible verses fail you, you turn on that worship music and let the truth of the lyrics be a voice that drowns out the lies of Satan. Likewise, you can also offer something called a breath prayer or a popcorn prayer, just a really short one sentence prayer. God of mercy, deliver me. Or Lord Jesus, help me. And then I want you to speak the name of Jesus. Claim him as your Lord. I claim Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then you say, as Jesus did, away from me, Satan. It seems simple, right? But it's not easy. We know this because the first challenge is recognition. It's recognition that, yes, Satan is real. His temptations are real and we do need to be on guard or as the Bible says, alert and aware. But we we don't need to cower in fear. We are not alone. We have the power of the spirit to resist. In Jesus, we are called overcomers. And the second challenge is to be aware of that which tempts us. And that's not necessarily going to be the same thing for all of us. For some people, it's substances, drugs, alcohol, food. For some, it's other forms of consumption, news, social media, the kinds of books we read or movies we watch. For some, temptation can even come disguised as a positive attribute, achievement, busyness. Temptation can even be religion and righteousness holding your own definition of God or your own definition of right and wrong above all else. That's what happens with the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law and the religious elite in Jesus' time. There are a lot of ways the devil can tempt us. But here's the thing. That's not something to be ashamed of. Being tempted, it doesn't mean we're unfaithful. It doesn't mean that we don't have the right amount or kind of faith. Being tempted doesn't mean we're dirty or sick or hopeless. It's just a reality of what it means to be human. It is part of our journey of faith. And so we have to be careful not to take shame upon ourselves and not to shame others. Because sometimes we can slip into this mode of, Deciding what temptation means for other people. If I'm tempted by this, then no one else should do it either. And that can be wrong too. We're actually going to see Paul talk about that in some of his letters. Some people, for instance, can buy an entire box of chocolate chip cookies and only eat one. I don't know you in real life if that's you, but that's amazing. I know better. I don't buy the cookies because I know I will eat the entire box while I sit on the couch and watch the spring baking show. Temptation is personal in its detail and yet common in its existence. So please take care. Let's all of us take care to not feel ashamed, but also to not worry about anyone's temptations other than our own. We don't need to hide the fact that we get tempted. I think there's power in just coming together and saying, yeah, I'm tempted by things. But also we want to make sure that we don't make someone else feel bad if they're able to buy, like I said, the box of cookies without eating the whole thing. So as we consider temptations, 
There's a lot to ponder, but here's a good place to start. I submit it's to begin to cultivate an attitude of humility and submission. In the letter of James, which is believed to be one of the oldest texts in the New Testament, Jesus' half-brother writes, Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submission to God is the first step. Humbling oneself to the way and will of God, even when things don't make sense in our understanding, even when a situation is the opposite of what we want or would choose for ourselves, we submit to God as Jesus did. Recognizing that against the devil, we don't have to defend God. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to prove who Jesus is. We just have to say, flee. Flee. That's how little power Satan really has. At that command, he goes. So my friends, let me end by reading to you Psalm 91. This is the very psalm that the devil tried to misinterpret and misapply because it's a psalm that Satan knows holds the truth. His darkness is absolutely no match for the light of God. Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That's the word of God, my friends. And it assures us that in the end, if we submit, if we put our trust in God, no matter what, if we cling to God and tell Satan to flee, we absolutely can be victorious. We absolutely have the power to resist temptation And we will find salvation in the eternal kingdom of God. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, thank you for these truths that we are overcomers because of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you included this this episode in scripture so that we could learn about Jesus being confronted by the devil and resisting Satan's temptation. Thank you that we can follow in that example. So God, help us to want to submit to you. Help us to cultivate that posture of humility. Help us to seek you out in your word and in prayer and in other types of spiritual disciplines. Prepare us, Lord, and then help us to recognize temptation when it comes and to not be afraid, but to stand firm and say, flee, for I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in the powerful and strong and mighty overcoming name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Bridge to Belief podcast, an offering from Kimberly Constant Ministries. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast. For more information about our ministry, including The Bridge, our soon-to-be-launched online worship community, and our flagship Bible study, Cover to Cover, 
and to register for our current Bible study, Emmanuel, a study of the New Testament, please visit www.kimberlyconstantministries.com. Thank you for tuning in to the Bridge to Belief podcast, an offering from Kimberly Constant Ministries. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast. For more information about our ministry, including The Bridge, our soon-to-be-launched online worship community, and our flagship Bible study, Cover to Cover, and to register for our current Bible study, Emmanuel, a study of the New Testament, please visit www.kimberlyconstantministries.com. Dot com.